Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, Decoding Data Quality with Data Products, sponsored today by Tamer. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them via the Q&A panel. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just a note, Zoom defaults the chat to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change it to network with everyone. To find your Q&A or the chat panels, you can find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested through out the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speakers for today, Matt Hosapful and Nick Leferrier. Matt is the head of corporate strategy and leads Tamer's technical solutions, working closely with customers on large-scale deployments. Prior to joining Tamer, Matt held positions in strategy at Sears Holdings and strategic sourcing at Dell, where he led the development and implementation of new analytic sourcing tools to significantly, significantly lower procurement costs. Nick is a technology leader focused on building out cloud deployments and infrastructure for early stage companies. Currently, he is the lead cloud architect at Tamer, where he leads cloud infrastructure, technical operations, and security efforts. At Tamer, he led cloud to cloud migration efforts, bootstrapped their SOC2 program, and is currently focused on developing Tamer's data products, enabling customers to use data product templates to consolidate messy source data into clean, curated, analytics ready data sets. And with that, I'll give the floor to Matt and Nick to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hello and uh, thank you everyone for, for joining. Um, before we get into the content here, um, we wanted to uh, just learn a little bit more about where everyone is at with, with data products. Um, and so, um, if you wouldn't mind, um, we would love if if people um, responded in the chat with um, where, where they're at in terms of familiarity with with data products. Is this a new concept? Are you familiar, or you know, are you off to the uh, to the races and have actually uh, implemented? We want to see some uh, some what some some trends are here, and uh, use that to to just make sure we're tailoring the uh, the content uh, appropriately. Um, so we'll give uh, a few uh, few more more seconds here for everyone to uh, to to key in a uh, an answer. Um, well, it looks like we do have one D multiple data products in production. That's awesome. A lot of a lot of A's. Um, good number of, of B's and C's. Really, um, kind of all all over the uh, all over the board. Um, which is not not terribly surprising, and it, it aligns uh, kind of very very well with. Um, what, what we see um, uh, with with our, our customers, typically we're we're working with um, larger enterprises, typically a um, uh, billion dollars and, and above, um, who have um, a, a kind of fair amount of um, complexity within their their data um, ecosystem. Um, and so, yeah, just some some last pieces here. Looks like we have a, a nice distribution of uh, people across uh, you know every every uh, level of, of familiarity. Um, which uh, is is great. I mean, we're we're certainly going to uh, cover um, some of the uh, kind of broader definitional pieces around uh, data products, and and hopefully um, be able to to get everyone on on the same page in terms of why why are data products needed, what's what's the value, and then uh, and then as well, uh, in addition, um, if you're starting on this this journey, what are some of the best practices uh, that you can learn from from others who um, have implemented data products and are, are starting to, uh, to to see value from it. Uh, just to, to level set um, all of us, um, the, the way that um, we we uh, define data product and and um, a definition that that we've seen um, that aligns pretty well with with how others in the um, industry think about it um, is is really that a, a data product. Um, I think the kind of key key part here within this is that it's it's a consumption ready set of of data um, that's used to help solve um, business challenges. Um, one of the things that um, you'll you'll see um, throughout this presentation is a is a key theme um, is really that last piece used to solve business business challenges and really understanding um, what is the the purpose of the the data product kind of first and foremost what what problems is it trying to solve and then and then work uh work backwards from from there um we'll get into some of the the complexities that 
can make this um, make this challenging. But um, at, at the simplest level, um, a product in any sense is is something that um, uh, should fulfill a, a, a end customer need. And in this case, the end customer is typically some uh, business stakeholder within the within the enterprise who's um, looking to use data in order to make a better decision, automate decision making, um, drive new insights, what, whatever it may be. And a data product um, can play a, a very uh, key role in, in that. Um, before we uh, get into some of the, the nitty gritty on how you actually implement uh, a data product um, strategy and ultimately ultimately to enable your, your business to, to work um, a lot smarter and more efficiently, um, be helpful to have some, some context on uh, kind of how, how we see uh, the ecosystem today. Um, so Nick, um, uh, share some of, the, some of that context. Yeah, so if we take a step back and look at kind of historically, a lot of the companies when, that we work with when we talk with them, 15-ish years ago, 20-ish years ago, they only had a pretty simple kind of architecture for what their data looked like. They would have an MDM that usually powered some of their operational applications that are critical to their business. And then they would export views from that to what nowadays we'd call a data warehouse, but would probably be an analytical database. Back in the day, that would power a lot of their BI and reporting for their decision-making process. And what we've seen is over the last, I don't know, 10-ish years, that the acceleration of people moving to the cloud, both to where they store and process their data, in addition to adopting cloud applications and SaaS applications, has really kind of exploded some of the complexity and the amount of different sources that you have and you have to deal with, and also the amount of integrations teams expect. Now, we see customers that might have multiple Salesforce instances in addition to a HubSpot instance, uh, just alone for their SaaS applications, just for managing their customers and their communication for them, right? And then oftentimes we'll then see individual teams are then buying external data to try and generate uh, and fill in values and specific reports and to help create better views in their data warehouse. In addition, there's now tools like BI tools are pretty standardized and expect kind of basic integration to data warehouse. You might have data science teams that are expecting certain views and tables to be constructed and consumed and uh, more kind of tech focused companies are already starting to build their own AI and ML models inside um, their organizations and expect high quality data products as the base to be able to train their models to be able to then put them into and tie them into existing operational use cases. It's a much more kind of complicated landscape that really lends itself to treating data like a product where historically it was just kind of a loose collection of views. And, and if, if we kind of think about what the, the headline has been from this migration to the cloud and um, really what a lot of the large cloud vendors really, really focus on. Um, it's been the story on the right of the explosion of, of data sources. You're gonna have a lot more data and you're gonna have a lot more tools in order to consume that, that data. One of the things that um, uh, can get a little bit uh, lost in, in that story um, is that um, becoming data-driven and actually getting the full value out of this new ecosystem, out of all of the new sources of data, all of the new um, and fantastic um, endpoints for, for consuming that data, um, it does um, have a cost um, in the form of uh, new requirements for, for data quality. Um, and so with, with BI and reporting, the, the big need was, you know, we need data to be clean and standardized. We need our date column to be uh, in a consistent <coughs> format. We need uh, country codes in consistent formats so that we can look at sales by, by country, et cetera. And so a lot of um, uh, data prep tools like like Alteryx, for example, um, really uh, kind of born out of out of these these needs. Let's let's let analysts be more effective in how they clean and standardize data. As new endpoints have um, uh, kind of come to market, and there are more ways that people are consuming data, uh, things like data science, for example, the the need changes. It's it's not enough anymore to have data that's clean and standardized. Now I need a lot of attributes. Um, because the more attributes I have, the, the better model I can build, the more predictive my uh, my model can be, and the more accurate it can be in its, its predictions. Um, as we've moved to, to more automated decision-making with things like customer data platforms that are um, really driving and firing marketing events um, for um, uh, kind of really uh, you know, large-scale customer interactions, 
um, it's created this need for a, a single view of a, of a customer. Um, we need to make sure that we have this integrated view of our customer profiles so that as we're executing on these events, um, that we're, we're doing that accurately and, and effectively. Next, as, as data apps have, have really grown and, and become um, uh, much more, more mainstream with the um, uh, growth of, of applications like Streamlit, for, for example, where um, people with um, Python and um, uh, uh, kind of a, a knowledge of um, uh, how to uh, kind of manage a, a database are able to, to build a, a simple uh, data app on top of that that they can serve as either an internal application or even an uh, external one that they, they post on, on their website. Um, one of the things that this enables is this puts end users much closer to the data itself and also just exposes a lot more of um, an organization's um, data. And so one of the things that this creates is the need for, for people to be able to uh, fix issues as, as, they, as they see them. The, the more uh, people who have access to data, which data apps is really driving, uh, the more um, kind of nuanced and narrow people's, people's feedback is going to be. I'm looking at an account that doesn't look right, a customer 360, whatever it may be. If I see an issue, I, I, I want uh, the need to uh, uh, have that issue resolved quickly. Um, and then finally, um, I think nothing kind of ha has brought this this point of uh, data quality um, to the forefront more than what we're seeing now with um, uh, these next generation AI ML models, things like large language uh, models, um, for for example, and, and just kind of the broader class of foundation models uh, that that people are are using in order to ultimately try to build up a, a better customer experience. Um, whether that's you know the kind of common use case like a chatbot, for example. Um, uh, people are putting AI and, and ML really at the, the center of their, their customer experience. And this creates a, a lot of pressure on all of the, the data quality requirements because garbage into to one of these models and you know, your, your reputation is, is potentially, uh, potentially ruined. These are uh, the, the types of things that uh, kind of end up in the, uh, the, the New York Times or um, kind of other uh, media outlets where if, if there is an issue with an AI ML model as a result of, of bad data, um, that could have, have serious um, implications. And so uh, the importance of data quality has, has really um, never been higher. Um, I think you know, the good news is that we've kind of been building towards this, this point. And so um, organizations aren't, aren't, total, aren't caught totally flat-footed, um, but certainly there's, there's more work um, to, to be done um, as evidenced by a lot of um, uh, kind of third-party um, data that, that's been collected on, on just uh, what is the state of data quality and, and data teams? I think you know one one of the uh, kind of common threads is that data leaders just can't uh, scale their their teams quickly enough. The number of sources that people are working with has exploded, like uh, like like Nick outlined at at the beginning, um, and uh, a lot of the impact of that has fallen um, on data teams to to fill in the gaps. We we don't have data that. Um, is accurate and, and trusted, well, our data team is gonna, gonna fill in that, that gap and that, that's creating heavy strain on, uh, on, on the organization. Um, a, a result um, of this is that decision makers aren't, aren't getting um, answers um, uh, fast, uh, fast enough. Um, and the, the number of, of companies that say, uh, or data leaders that say their company is data-driven hasn't, hasn't really moved um, despite all of, um, all of, all of this um, uh, investment. Um, I think you know, one of one of our um, uh, customers um, uh, is a is a chief data officer, and um, he's in the uh, the media and entertainment um, business. And kind of specifically, his his internal stakeholders are um, uh, talent agents, and and for them, the the key metric that that they measure um, is really around analytic velocity and, and time to insight. They they track. Um, for a question that a, a talent agent um, uh, has, how quickly would they be able to to, to answer it and, and have uh, kind of various um, scenarios that they, they they evaluate in order to just understand how that metric's trending? Um, because they know that if people don't get the decision, aren't able to answer their question fast enough, they're not going to use data. And so their only way of being data driven is by uh, being able to, to answer those those questions quickly. <clears throat> and then finally, um, just on this point of um, uh, AI and kind of the importance of it. Um, I think, uh, I mean, the hype is more than just hype at this point. Um, organizations are putting serious uh, dollars um, uh, behind um, uh, AI and, uh, and, and using it in order to 
um, kind of stay stay ahead of the the, the curve, which is awesome. Um, a lot of a lot of great opportunities um, that are possible. The issue is that executives don't trust the the, the data um, that's going into these systems, and so to this point previously of uh, um, reputations being being at risk and, and on the line. Cer certainly, um, uh, it'll be uh, kind of interesting to see how the the next uh, the, the coming months and years um, unfold on on this front because there is a lot of top down pressure to use AI, but um, I think a lot of people generally feel like um, that that could be uh, very risky given the uh, the, the state of uh, of their data. Yeah, in addition, AI is not the only kind of technology that's driving some of these conversations. What we see is a lot of our customers, in addition to trying to do these data projects to make their company more data driven, it's often usually paired with a project to move to the cloud or switch clouds. That for a lot of reasons, usually the first project that a lot of large companies do when they're moving to the cloud is moving their data assets, their data warehouse, over to cloud-based resources to try and take advantage of the elastic compute there to enable uh, latencies and kind of applications that they couldn't have done before with on-prem hardware. Now, this is just gonna expand even drastically of when people start to build out AI use cases and try and leverage machine learning more and more in their business operations, they're gonna really need high quality data to be able to do that. And that's gonna, make these data teams have to almost solve two technology problems at the same time as trying just to get to the point where they have good clean data. Or oftentimes that they're going to have to be the ones um, building out the foundation of their cloud environments and their cloud infrastructure and how they want that to work. In addition to also providing integrations into the either data analysts or machine learning teams that are trying to consume that data to build out models. But this really kind of puts a focus on and should make you think about how you want to manage your data and thinking about what your data product strategy is to be able to do this repeatable across kind of multiple use case, which really kind of dovetails into um, something we've seen from a lot of customers that they start with use cases approaches, but they're really successful ones are thinking more along the lines of data products than use cases. Yeah, and, um, uh, just on, on this point of uh, the, the use case uh, based approach, um, I, I think, um, you know, now kind of kind of more than ever, the, this is becoming um, difficult for um, uh, data leaders. Um, one of our uh, customers had a um, a healthcare uh, company. He's uh, he's been under a lot of um, budget pressure um, uh, within the uh, with, within the the organization. Effectively, um, he has some important analytic and, and business initiatives that that he needs to needs to support. Um, but uh, funding now is is much uh, more more difficult to come by. They they they're switching to a model where um, they need to be able to have uh, kind of clear chargebacks to the um, to the business um, in order to to fund some of the investment and in modernization that that they want to make um, as they're in the middle of their their cloud uh, journey. Um, and I think one of the kind of first um, insights that that he had was the only way that um, he um, and his team are going to be able to be to be successful in in this new this new model is um, effectively if they operate. Um, in in a way where instead of every use case is you know a dollar basically and then they have a dollar of of cost um, they need to make it so that a use case um, is is something that can be used um, much much more broadly and so if they're getting a dollar of revenue um, it's it's not a dollar a cost it's you know twenty five cents to serve it and and kind of continuously decreasing um, uh, they know that. Uh, just just adding more more resources to to the problem and and trying to uh, kind of fund their um, their their initiatives um, purely through just doing more more use cases um, isn't going to uh, to to be um, effective um, for them uh, anymore. They need to um, uh, kind of shift away from uh, uh, the use case mindset and one towards um, where they're really thinking of how to, how can they be most most profitable. Um, as a um, as a as a team, um, which is what's really driven them to to kind of think about um, how do they manage their their data as a as a product so that they 
they can uh, kind of operate more as a, a PL as opposed to a um, uh, kind of a consulting staffing agency where you're uh, uh, doing much more kind of one to one uh, mapping of use case to, to people. Yeah, so one of the parallels that, that at least I naturally gravitate towards when thinking about this problem comes from the perspective of how different um, like SaaS application providers have their offerings, right? Where there's companies that will do a traditional hosting-based solution where they'll have spin up separate set of dedicated infrastructure resources for every customer that they have. And that's the more old school hosting of, hey, we onboarded, say, if you're running a WordPress site, we onboarded a new customer, we're going to spin up a whole new WordPress application for them, dedicated resources, dedicated databases. That doesn't scale very well in terms of how you can leverage your staff. Like for every 10 new customers, you might need a new employee to be able to manage all of that versus multi-tenant SaaS applications, which are kind of the standard now. You can scale your staff and your resources and your costs sublinearly to the amount of customers and requests that you're scaling. That's really also what kind of happens with data products. When you start investing in the platform to be able to serve all these different use cases, and have everyone pointing at the same set of resources, and you can standardize a lot of these processes, you can start to scale your data quality and your resources in a sublinear to the amount of requests that you're getting from your stakeholders. That literally makes it a very high leverage um, solution to how you can meet your business needs. And the, yeah, go ahead, Matt. No, oh, I was going to say, and one, one of the, uh, I think kind of most challenging um, pieces or kind of biggest mind shift, uh, mindset uh, shifts that, that we see um, within the, the journey towards managing um, data as a product ultimately to, to get much better data quality um, is the, the feedback uh, management cycle. Um, I think it, it's become uh, kind of common wisdom and common knowledge that if you're, you're building a, a product of any kind, um, that one of the first things you should do is um, quote unquote, get out of the building, go get feedback, learn from customers and, and continue to, to iterate. Um, and that, that's a, a muscle that um, can be um, uh, challenging um, within uh, kind of data um, uh, organizations because it, it, it does require a, a unique set of processes and capabilities to be able to actually manage that, that feedback loop incorporated into the, um, into the data product and, and ensure that that, that data product um, is something that's continuously getting better. You don't have people doing kind of the classic move of, if I see an issue with the data, I'm going to download it into Excel, I'm going to make changes, and then I'm going to be able to get my report done um, and, and serve that, uh, that end um, user need, but rather having good process and, and governance in place so that um, people aren't uh, just rushing to make you know, some uh, end tweaks or tweaks on the edges to uh, to a spreadsheet in order to ultimately solve that kind of short term need, but are really thinking much longer term on on how to improve uh, improve the data on an ongoing basis. Um, I, and you know, one one of the things that has really um, I think been been a bit of a, a, a challenge um, with. Um, building uh, data products um, in in the past um, has been um, the the best practices for for uh, building uh, data products um, can be uh, can be expensive. Um, uh, I think historically, um, if you wanted to uh, build data products, you're, you're kind of uh, looking at uh, the options of well, do I just hire more data engineers and stewards in order to take on this this new workload in order to, to put in place new uh, new processes, um, improve our, our data operations. Do we just reduce our scope? Um, uh, where uh, in, instead of um, uh, trying to um, hire more people and, and scale out, um, maybe we say, you know, we are only going to manage our, our customer um, data. I think a lot of uh, kind of traditional approaches to, to master data management have, have kind of fallen in in this um, this view of well we're going to have this, this very narrow set of data we're going to manage it very tightly put a lot of top down governance on it but it's going to be trusted high quality and we just hope it <laughs> it covers enough of um, what we are trying to do um, in order to to be 
um, effective and and successful. I think there's a, a comment in the chat here. These these more like the uh, the the dumb practices. I, th I think you know certainly it uh, it can can feel that way. I mean these all seem very uh, expensive, but uh, these are what, uh, what what we see people kind of often doing in order to, to kind of get get out of uh, kind of data debt uh, challenges. Yeah, and recently we've also seen an uptake in people trying to incorporate AI to also help out with this, where it can make your developers and your data engineers far more effective. A lot of these ML models have code plugins that are IDEs that uh, if you use BigQuery, you can even enable it right in the Google console with generating SQL queries, just asking questions and it can generate your report views. That's really a high leverage kind of tool that can help enable and make your existing team more productive. It's also starting to uh, see it used in a lot of other different use cases where you can ask it if you have a good system set up, you can ask it questions about specific rows or clusters of records of like, is this a person or a company? And you can then use that as a DLP tool. Uh, like, hey, we do not want to process people inside of our company data products. So if this is a person, can you please filter it out? You can tie it just directly into the system that you would normally ask like a data steward or a curator to go and manually remove that row or ask them that question, what is this doing here? Also, another good use case for it is enrichment of these sparse data sets where at its core, a lot of these LLM models are meant to just predict the next word. That can also be used to predict the next cell or attribute in the data. So for some of these fields that have very common things where we see a classic example is someone will fill in a partial address of like, there's Boston's the city, but then we've stayed in country blank. Most of the models will be able to guess what those attributes are pretty easily. And tying that into your systems, that can be a very good tool where you're not taking up any time for a human and they can go and fill in a lot of those values for you. And it's also, if you have a system where you already have a baked in kind of task management workflow, where you have tickets coming in and curators or stewards managing those tickets and then applying changes to models, uh, well, not to models, but to your data sets, you can plug in AI models into that to give, hey, this is what we suggested, what we think should happen, and just have your agents accept those changes and auto commit uh, the changes to your data. It can really save them a lot of time of having to do some manual process work there. And, and uh, AI certainly is not a uh, a silver a silver bullet. It 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 is providing a lot of value as 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 uh, kind of described here. But I, I think the important thing is that um, what AI really enables within data engineering more broadly um, is it enables um, data engineers and data practitioners to um, really um, kind of use much more declarative logic in in defining a data product. Um, and being able to reduce the amount of complexity with um, creating and, and managing a, a data product. I mean, it's very similar to, I think, what we've seen with, with software engineering practices where um, uh, kind of the, uh, the initial efforts was just making software um, engineering that was something that was much more tractable and be able to understand kind of distinct functions. I think we're, we're seeing something similar with data engineering where you have uh, kind of distinct transformations, uh, DBT really kind of drove this with analytic engineering where you have distinct models in order to handle different parts of uh, of a pipeline that are that are very reusable um, and what AI is is enabling is kind of taking that to the uh, to the next the next level where now um, uh, data engineering can be much more um, declarative in in nature um, and instead of uh, kind of operating at the level of needing to write um, a lot of individual transformations, um, being able to um, uh, kind of push that down to to AI and really um, focus more on the business logic um, of of the, the the data product itself. Um, and if if we think about uh, kind of where where that um, is is ultimately um, heading, in, in our opinion, um, you know, our, our view is that most organizations will have a data product platform that combines. Um, uh, this more um, declarative approach to um, data engineering and data transformation with 
um, human interfaces in order to drive collaboration on the, the data itself. Um, in most cases, the people who are expected to deliver value from data, um, uh, sales ops, uh, people in sales ops, uh, people in procurement analytics, um, for example, they might have some understanding of SQL and, and how to transform data, but really um, their, their superpower is understanding um, uh, their business, understanding, for example, um, uh, end customers in the case of sales and in the case of procurement, being able to understand suppliers and kind of the nuances of, of the market. Um, so if they can interact with their data team at more of the, the business logic level and then give feedback on individual points within the data, then it really elevates the, the quality of, of conversation and, and ensures that um, there can be good, effective um, collaboration. Um, and it, it kind of definitely feels like we are very much um, heading in, in this, uh, this, this direction um, where we are able to uh, have business and, and data teams kind of interacting at the, the business logic level, and then after that data product is delivered, um, be able to manage it through um, human human interfaces, kind of very, very similar to um, uh, tools like Zendesk, for example, where it'd be <laughs> impossible to imagine shipping a product without some form of, of feedback where customers could say, hey, I'm having this issue, and then we're able to, to learn from it. Um, we think the same is true with, with data products where um, it, it'll be unimaginable in four or five years um, for you to ship a data product and not have a mechanism for collecting feedback, for being able to track usage and, and adoption of, of that, that data product. Um, that's what's represented in, in these consumption services where collaboration is, is, uh, is, is key. And kind of beyond um, the, uh, you know, the, the benefits described, ultimately having a, a data product um, a strategy in, in place and, and having all these tools and mechanisms for managing those, those data products effectively um, should increase speed, accuracy of uh, decision-making and, and make people feel confident in the, the data that, that they're using. Um, one of the really key, key drivers of um, data products, and in, in my opinion, the most important uh, piece of data products is that it really breaks down the barriers between uh, data teams and, and business teams and, and really kind of um, makes it easier for these teams to collaborate on the on the data itself because it's a common set of assets that are continuously improving and you have uh, kind of clear rules of engagement for um, how to give feedback on that data, how it improves and what the SLAs are associated with it. Um, it's, it's kind of antithetical to the traditional approach of um, we have data that lives in a warehouse and then we have a, an analyst that, that sits in the line of business and then they do uh, kind of bespoke data prep in order to, to serve a, uh, a use case. Um, that, that certainly uh, can help get things done, um, uh, but you get um, not uh, great uh, kind of leverage more broadly. And also the, the collaboration there is very siloed um, because um, you have this um, island of, of data debt, which is the, uh, the, the, the spreadsheet on the, the analyst's uh, desktop uh, that um, other people, you know, might not have access to, and there, there isn't good built-in collaboration in, in a lot of these, these cases. Yeah, so one of the other questions that often comes up when we start to talk to customers about why they're looking at enhancing their data is recently in the last six months, there's been the huge focus in the industry of everyone talking about AI, what's your AI story? How is AI going to disrupt your business or your customers, your industry? So one of the questions that we'd love to see what everyone's response to is in the poll, where are they on their AI journey? You're just starting to learn about the technology, starting to use it potentially in some POCs, have it in production and kind of non-critical workloads where it's just kind of on the side as you're growing your kind of expertise and how to use them, how to run them and how to integrate it into your business or or are they already kind of a core part of your business? So the reason we're asking this is because the first step, usually when we're having conversation with customers about why they're using data products or why they're starting this journey on data products is the very first thing we think that they should know is why they're doing it and what their goals are. And a lot of times that is to enable some of these things around 
being able to deliver AI or having a story around that, or they may even have a vision of where they can use that. So you got really wide range of results. It looks like most people are just starting at the beginning of their journey with AI. Looks like we've got I think another slide. Matt, you want to go into? Yeah, I, I uh, appreciate the question on. You know, what do you mean by AI and if statistical predict predictive models qualify? Because I, I think that that is a uh, important point, which is that I think a lot of these uh, technologies around AI, machine learning, um, people are using in in some way, way, shape, or, or form. Um, uh, just uh, you know, it might be some of the. Uh, you know, quote unquote, earlier uh, versions uh, of it. But I, I think from a uh, organizational um, readiness uh, standpoint, um, those those examples and being able to point to some of the, the statistical models that that do drive decision making in an automated way can can help um, really get buy in on um, a, a much broader um, strategy related to, for example, using AI in a in a data product um, strategy. Um, Financial services is a kind of good example. Very regulated industry, um, a lot of certainly a lot of risk, um, and uh, definitely has been one of the industries kind of at the forefront of of using um, AI through uh, an ML through through some of the um, modeling it uh, that they do and things like underwriting, for example. Um, and I think being able to to point to examples like that through an organization really helps a lot with getting buy in and, and budget. Um, you know, kind of above all, whether it's an AI strategy or a data product uh, kind of strategy specifically, starting with your why is by far the the the, the most um, <laughs> the most important most important piece. We we love um, when uh, we get on a call with a, a prospect or a, a customer, and they say we we need to implement a data product for our customers um, because we are trying to improve the effectiveness of a CDP that we implemented. Very clear why we know that it's going to be a very successful um, uh, engagement. They're not just you know, shopping for a stack, if you will, but but they do have a, a clear business problem that uh, that, that they're, they're looking to solve. Um, as, as you get going with the, the, the data product strategy, uh, some of the, the specific challenges that, that we um, see organizations um, facing um, include um, how to um, aggregate um, disparate sources. And, and, and I think more, more importantly, it's just understanding um, uh, when is this going to be uh, needed in order to really drive um, meaningful um, uh, outcomes. I think particularly when you have um, uh, data sets that are frequently changing, things like um, external data, and also when there are a lot of insights in the long tail of of your data, um, this becomes a an important challenge to um, just have in the, the top of your mind as you as you start to move towards a a data product um, a strategy um, in in the world of uh, just kind of you know basic reporting or uh, uh, trying to understand um, you know maybe kind of one off customers here and there that this type of of problem. Um, isn't isn't going to be particularly painful, but the, the more that you're trying to use your data as a product and use it for things like automated um, decision making, the, the more that um, you need to have an answer for, you know, one, just how big of a problem is this is this for you, and, and two, do you have a, a solution and a way to, uh, to to solve it? Because data integration um, is is not uh, free, um, and so being ready for that going into your data product uh, journey. Um, is is really important in order to ultimately meet the timelines you you expect. Yeah. So when we start talking with customers, one of the things they get a little bit afraid of is how big the project can feel when they start talking about what their end goal is and why they want to do it and where they would love to be at an end state. And what we really want to try and help them define and start with is define their use case for what is their minimally viable data product. 
And oftentimes what we want them to focus on early on is data integration and not system integration. So for the data integration, the architecture of that looks a lot, well, there's a lot of boxes and arrows. Matt, you can click the next slide. Uh, well, there's a lot of boxes and arrows and it looks like there's a lot of moving parts. At its core, it's really just trying to get all your data into one place, into a data warehouse, where you can then start to clean and aggregate the data and create views where you can then point upstream applications at to use to drive a use case, right? So for one of our customers that effectively met that we would just take all their data that they had, whether it's from their Shopify, from their uh, Facebook advertisement, their Google advertisement, and just getting into their data warehouse. And then they use one of our customer focused data products to clean up, create a basic view of their customers that they're then able to put into their marketing tools to do segment analysis and targeted marketing to their customers, right? And then they're able to really kind of say, hey, we can create this view. These are the segment demographics we really want to go after and target. Now, it wasn't tied to any of their operational kind of systems where it's not something that's tied to anything that's trying to generate recommendations inside their website in real time as people are checking out or trying to do upsells or managing their golden record of an SOA customer. It's just trying to build what is the smallest kind of use case that can be valuable to the business and answering the why. Now, if they set up that architecture in a good way and have some forethought on how to do it, Doing the system integration piece next is a lot more of an incremental step than it is necessarily a massive project that they were afraid of when they started. Now, this is a different customer, uh, Novacure, that uh, we have a lot of, for us, uh, external material on and about their data journey. There's a QR code on top that you can scan to find out more about what we've done with them. But... They started off as just doing the data integrations, but once they had that work hand to end and then trust in that data, they then built in integrations using MuleSoft to be able to then push that data back into their SAP system to actually drive their operational use cases that are kind of mission critical to them. And that's really what we mean by system integration. That's a much higher bar to usually get done where you start getting a lot more things around needing to go through change approval boards and get a lot of other teams to sign off on those changes. So we tend to have customers focus in starting on more data integration at first, build up trust in that data, build the basic uh, views that they want to use, and then eventually switch over to doing the system integration and actually consuming those systems, like the output of their data products into their operational systems. And um, an another uh, pretty common challenge is, is just around um, how, do you, how do you sort through this mix of legacy, homegrown, and modern uh, tooling in order to uh, improve your data KPIs, um, if you will, kind of across the board, whether that's from you know, data quality to analytics and, and automated decision making. Um, and and we'll, we'll share a, a customer story on um, how they were able to um, kind of do uh, or manage this this trade off effectively, um, but but first I, I um, do want to address the, uh, the the question in the uh, the chat here on how, how do you define a minimum viable uh, data product? I think that's a that's a great uh, question, and and I think you know uh, one of the um, uh, kind of things that's uh, really important thinking through how to define a, a minimum um, viable data product is that um, you know it it should uh, really help to prove out both the business goal um, and reduce uh, and, and serve the, the business need, and then also um, prove out technical goals or reduce overall technical risk. And so, you know, what, what I mean by, by that is, um, it, let's say that you are building a customer data product where ultimately um, that data product is going to be used for customer um, segmentation. Um, it's useful as part of defining the minimum viable data product to also um, scope out how that customer data product um, could be 
um, used for um, a different application, such as um, sales territory alignment or um, within within a, a CDP. Um, because one of the things that's um, you know really uh, kind of critical to managing um, data as a product is being able to go through that full end-to-end -end loop of adding new attributes, new sources, and, and taking feedback so that um, the data product can serve multiple use cases. Um, if the minimum viable um, data product only maps to one single um, application or, or use case, there, there's a lot of risk that um, you're kind of back where, where you were, where you have this data asset that, that actually is high quality and, and good, um, uh, but um, it serves a very um, uh, narrow need um, and doesn't have um, kind of a, a clear path towards being able to serve a, a much broader need and also doesn't have the, the broader buy-in that if we're going to be um, doing any sort of analytics around our customers, um, that we're going to use this, this data product as the, as the, the foundation. Uh, for it. Um, and so doing some of that extra work up front, just to make sure that what you're building can actually scale and be leveraged across um, multiple um, applications um, is, um, is, is really um, uh, important. Um, and, and this kind of gets at a question in the, in the chat on just uh, defining your use case and, and you know, the contradiction between that and, and moving away from, from use cases. Um, I think that um, you know, the word use case um, we, we definitely <laughs> presented that as, uh, as, a, as a bad word, but um, ultimately you, you do need kind of downstream applications. And it's, it's the one-to-one the -one mapping of a data asset to that individual use case and, and just kind of creating that silo, that, you know, that new silo. It might be an aggregated data set, but it's still a silo and um, still a source of, of uh, data debt, um, kind of ensuring that, that you're not going down that path is, is really the, the key the key part of it and ensuring that your minimum viable data product and where you start can serve multiple purposes and um, can prove out that you have a good and effective feedback loop and a way to to improve that that data product over time, adding sources, adding attributes, curating those those attributes, um, because that's really kind of what's what's challenging and different about a data product versus just, hey, this is a pretty good table that uh, someone is using for a dashboard. Yeah, so back on this the whole concept of the journey of how to do this, and this is really a journey of modernization and kind of switching to the cloud. So we've been working with Old Mutual now for, I think, a couple of years, and they started out when we first were talking to them. They didn't even have an AWS environment set up yet. They were just, they were still running an MDM system with parts of it running on a mainframe, but they knew they didn't want to continue to support into the future. So that was really a huge chunk of their why was that they wanted a more modern system that they could use and they wanted, they knew that their data wasn't great and that they thought that there was a lot of value that they could derive from it. So when we started working with them, the first thing that we focused on was an analytical uh, solution that would generate some clean data set on their customers that they were then allowed to, they, they then used in like quarterly review processes and trying to do some audit based processes of like, hey, we are selling insurance and we have this insurance policy out, the policy holder, we have a death record for that no longer alive, can we cancel that contract, close it out so we stop making payments or stop having to like premiums and go, uh, kind of close the loop of that individual kind of customer story or customer journey. Once they had built up good trust in that data, they started to then use APIs that were pointing at their data product and the data warehouse at the point of kind of consumption, where, where they built it into their business applications to search for existing customers when people would open up accounts. So that way they can link it and say, we already have a record of this person. They're just adding an extra account or an extra person to their account and not create a whole new identity and ID for that person to prevent the sprawl of bad data from propagating throughout their system. And then they're in the process and almost fully done with switching over to now, pointing their business applications to other update endpoints to create endpoints on top of the new real-time source system that's directly tied in and to their data product. So that architecture, when you zoom out, uh, 
And if you go to the next slide, uh, this is what it looks like from our perspective, where they started out building out a landing zone and putting exports from their existing NDM system into a landing zone. And we took that up, built a re uh, reconciliation process, used our secret sauce of AI and ML to clean that data and really make it the highest quality that we could and then put it into a real-time store that was able to serve the, them to run analytical uh, reports off of. They then started tying into APIs, starting mainly with read and search APIs, pointing at that real-time system and that store, and eventually switched over to using the full CRUD suite and pointing their business applications at those endpoints. And then they were able to slowly move off the rest of their applications from using their old MDM system to just using the kind of new latest and greatest system. But this was a long journey over several years and several distinct phases that they started with where they wanted to be. And we were able to increment our way there, starting out with answer or delivering business value as soon as we could. Great. And uh, just as you um, head down uh, this this journey, um, you know, some of the the, the questions that, that we think are um, really important in kind of uh, shaping uh, the, the direction of the market. Um, one is just just around um, uh, kind of the domain specific um, needs that that will come up. I think one of the things that um, we've noticed with um, our customers who've implemented a, a data product strategy. Um, is that uh, the the nuances of of the industry become increasingly important the kind of broader that that data product um, becomes and so the, the more external data for example that that you're trying to integrate into into your data product um, the the more important it becomes that um, uh, you're partnering with with people who who really understand the domain and are building tooling um, for the the specific needs of of those domains. Yeah, the other thing that is, as AI becomes more and more popular, almost every tech company will have something that they'll say is AI, and they'll say it's even generative AI. And if their answer is just that they have more advanced search, that usually just means that they used an AI model to generate embeddings and put it in an extra database and is a slightly more advanced search bar, or they'll have some chatbot. And sometimes that chatbot can just be trained on their doc site is really just is basically automated support. You should really be looking for, do they actually have use cases where they can say, hey, we use AI in this specific way to deliver this value. It's not just a chat bar that pops up when you log in or an extra search bar added somewhere. It really should be tied into their product and actually have a concrete use case. Yeah, and then and then finally, um, you know, certainly uh, the data products um, kind of mindset and managing data as a product, and also um, layering in in AI um, uh, can uh, require some some changes in in skill sets, and, and certainly I, th this is something to to just uh, understand uh, kind of going into into your journey is is do you have the the right um, people and, and skills in place in order to, to make this successful. Um, really, I think one of the big promises of um, AI is that it will make um, it much simpler for, for people to be um, very productive with, uh, for example, you know, highly technical uh, solutions. And, and so it should ultimately simplify the, the, the skill set and reduce the um, kind of diversity of skills that, that are needed. But this is is something to, uh, to to push on in order to really understand uh, what is the the maturity of the kind of AI application that uh, uh, that you're looking to uh, to adopt. Yeah, and just uh, some kind of core takeaways from my perspective as to wrap this up is that as much as I think a lot of us here on this call are probably very tech heavy and technologists at our core, it's very easy to get sucked up into what is the latest, greatest technology and spend all your time talking about, oh, should we be using Snowflake or BigQuery? Are you AWS, Azure, GCP? Technology at the end of the day is just a tool. What really matters is the outcomes that you're driving, the business cases that you're enabling, 
and really focusing on the outcomes and like technology isn't the only interfaces that matter and tying together the systems somewhere at the end of the day there's humans that are involved in this process that are either consuming the data you in some way shape or form whether that's someone at a pos system in a store trying to look up someone's customer loyalty number to do a return or you have a seller that's trying to get updated information for a contact to renew a deal it's humans at the end of the day that are consuming this data so you have to design the you have to use the technology to make their jobs easier and to enable them and another thing that we try and really preach our customers is don't try and solve everything day one start with something that is as small as possible that can deliver value to your business and iterate from there because if you can deliver value early on it's easier to get the further investment to continue going down the journey versus if the bigger you try and do something at the start the more permanent it is to running late or going over budget or just not getting finished and then the last thing is a lot of people will look at some of these slides and be like, oh, that's simple. We think we have the team to do that. We can do that. The question at the end of the day is kind of, it's a false dichotomy in my mind. It's more of a question is, do you want to spend time on building out these data and system integrations yourself or actually figuring out how to tie it into your business applications and your business process that's closer aligned to your core business and what the value your business offers than you're just tying together these systems? I think we have a couple minutes left here for Q&A. Nick and Matt, thank you so much for this great presentation. If you have questions for either of them, feel free to submit them in the Q&A panel. We've had you've answered a lot of questions along the way that came in through the chat already and just answer the most commonly asked questions i will uh, send a follow-up email by end of day thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording of this session so uh diving in here so can you share any real world examples of how companies have successfully implemented data products to address their specific data quality challenges yeah yeah ab absolutely so um we, we did highlight um i mean some some examples such as uh no nova cure i think another one um that uh comes to mind uh for me which um i think is a is a really good uh story in terms of the amount of leverage that it created for the business is um, one of our customers is a asset manager um specifically a venture uh, venture capital firm um and uh the firm is maybe 20 people um, and the data team is, is maybe um, three, three or four people. And so um, uh, kind of efficiency was, was really um, key uh, uh, to them in, in order to be effective. Um, the, the data team um, was, was brought on board under the kind of basic premise that the, this venture capital firm uh, primarily invests in consumer um, businesses and consumer businesses um, there are a lot of alternative data sources in under, in, uh, that enable you to understand the, the health of an industry as well as the health of, of uh, an individual business. You can get external data that, that shows credit card transactions at individual um, storefronts. Um, and um, they knew that in order to, to get an edge in, in the market, um, they would need to, to find a way to use um, this data in order to, to get ahead of um, some of these uh, some of these trends and be and know um, you know which of their portfolio companies, for example, should they be trying to double down on, or which of their um, uh, which companies that have maybe only raised a little bit of money should they try to engage with early so they could be a lead um, uh, investor um, uh, and 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 help accelerate the growth. Um, and so the the data team was was brought in in order to to really kind of build out the the full um, set of data apps that. Um, the um, investing team would use in order to understand trends in the market and then be able to, to make these, these decisions. Um, and the way that they did that was through a, a data product strategy where um, they put in place data products for um, companies first and foremost, and then also for um, contacts, who do they know within those companies, as well as data products for um, their, their investors so that they could uh, kind of tie in, even though it's a small group, um, have clear linkages between um, the people in their firm and the, and the people that, that they're engaging with um, and, and have in, had interactions with um, 
uh, over time. Um, and so they they put this this in place, and in a matter of um, getting the full kind of stack in place and starting to get first insights was uh, was about six months. And um, once they had it in place, um, it was um, uh, just a matter of uh, weeks until um, they were actually making investment decisions um, using this this data. They they found some uh, kind of early um, signals that one of their portfolio companies was starting to get um, a lot of traction and and could kind of take take their growth to the next level with with an additional round of capital. And so um, they used that insight in order to engage the portfolio company who was um, you know, kind of agreed with their their view of the, the market um, and, and ultimately enabled them to get kind of preferential um, terms on, on the round. Um, but I think this is a great example of where uh, a company was able to get a lot of leverage in their, their data stack as a result of putting in place a, a data product strategy um, and be able to accomplish things that um, you know, years ago, I think having a team of that size be able to move that quickly and have have that type of impact in such a competitive industry would be um, incredibly challenging. Oh, we've got some great questions coming in, but I'm afraid that is all the time that we have for this session. So I'll get those additional questions over to you all, uh, to, to Tamer, and so that you can get to those and see those. But Matt and Nick, thank you so much for this great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. It's uh, a lot of fun and uh, looking forward to keeping the conversation going. I love it. And thanks to all our attendees for being so engaged We do in everything we do. Again, I'll just send a reminder. I'll send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the recording and links to the slides. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.